right, good afternoon. Welcome to another Wall Street Wednesday. Today is April 28th, 2021, and this is our 46th actually episode. Afternoon, Paul, how are you? I'm doing good. So, um, wait for a few people to join. Usually, again, do my customary that, remember that as you watch this, these are my opinions, my thoughts, and that you should speak to your wealth advisor, your broker, before making any transactions. Again, these are my opinions. So, a lot to cover today. Was listening to uh, the uh, Fed chairman, Chairman Powell, so he had some things going on. So, I'll talk about that. And uh, we'll finish talking about, um, what's up, boo? We'll finish talking about um, um, price them, my price them all. And then, again, I've been looking at these cryptos and having conversation about crypto, so I'm going to talk about that too. Gary, how are you? Good to see you. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Pretty much, it's interesting. Quiet day on the market. The Fed chair spoke. But what's really interesting is we're in the middle of earnings season. You have a number of corporations, some major players that are actually beating the numbers. Um, the num they're reporting earnings better than expected. And right now, it looks like that for the market, they just don't care. There's no follow through. So we're not seeing any follow through on the earnings plays. As I told you earlier, we're in earnings season, and usually you can make some money. Um, I had advised, and I'm still advising that, that don't buy stocks ahead of the number now. Um, it looks like that even the stocks that have run before the number, there's no follow through on the number. So um, again, our goal is to make money, so therefore I would wait. And if a stock does report good numbers, one that you like, and one that you wanna trade or own long term, I would buy it after the number. Um, and basically, after the number, it looks like even the ones, like I said, that are beating the number, the earnings estimates, the earnings numbers, are actually having a pullback. So today on the close, we're waiting for two big ones, Apple and Facebook. So it'll be interesting to see how they trade. Um, both but basically traded like there's been flat. Tyler, how are you? Congratulations on your brother accepting the scholarship to San Diego State. And uh, for those of you, Tyler is one of my former students. And... Um, I almost had it. She almost decided to get her PhD in finance, but instead she went for MBA. No problem. But uh, we might get her in the finance on that. But welcome. Good to see you. All right. Um, so let's get started. A couple of things. My notebook as usual. Um, on the commodity side, I don't have any commodities for you today. As I told you, I modified what I was doing commodities. So in other words, I'm only going to talk to you about commodities that have given me both a fundamental and a technical buy. Now, last week we talked about, and hold on a second, I'll even pull up my notes. Last week we talked about um, gold and the yen on the buy side. Well, they both seem to have pretty much topped out and have slept some pullbacks. So if you went long notes, take, you, hopefully you took your profits. On the other side, we had, I mentioned live cattle. Live cattle broke down, it's still in a downward trend. So if you're short live cattle, stay short live cattle. Um, and then other than that, that's basically the only ones I saw for this week. We had a couple of commodities run, but in general, that's what I saw. So again, if you're short live cattle, stay short live cattle. It's breaking down. Um, it really is actually broken some support levels. So it literally looks like to the downside. Give me one second. I'll even pull up the chart again as we speak. Um, give me one second. I was just looking at it. Oh, that's Lean Hogs. Live cattle, LE. So, live cattle. Yeah, I mean, it's broken down. So, you can see it broke its 10-day moving average back on the 15th, um, 14th, 15th. And from there, it's done nothing. It's gone from basically 122 to right now, you're down to 116. So, it's a been a, it's been a, been a actually big move to the downside on, on huge volume, too. So that's two of the things we look at. So I would stay with that if you're long. Um, um, let's see. Um, I'm, I'm reading a question here from, a, uh, let's see what it says. We'll watch replay, but have a question on how you think 10-year yields, other rates may change. Literally, um, great question. I was sitting here watching um, Chairman Powell testify, you know, not testify, but actually the Q&A and listen to his comments. And what's interesting is, his contention is that um, inflation is pretty much where they expected it. The goal is still 2%. We're slightly behind, but we probably will get to hit 2%. And 
And he also basically stated that as far as he's concerned, he's going to keep rates right where they are, um, between 0 and 25 basis points. So basically with that, um, you can expect the yields to pretty much stay right where they're at. Now, what's interesting, and I'm going to pull this up, and you mentioned that question. Give me one second. I always have to go pull these things up to make sure I'm talking about what I want to talk about. Um, bear with me. All right. But I'm looking at the commitment of trade report. You guys know I look at the commitment of trade report. What's going on, Richard? I look at the commitment of trade report to see what's going on with the institutions, what they're doing. And it's really interesting. I'm going to the currencies right now. Based on the commitment of trade report, um, um, investors are thinking that the 30-day 30, the 30 Fed funds rate is actually going to go down. So they're playing for the price to go up and yields to drop on that. So that's pretty interesting. The other thing right now, it looks like that the market that investors are actually um, bullish to 10-year note. So it looks like they think the 10-year notes actually, the two and the 10-year notes actually going to uh, increase in price and drop yields. So that's pretty interesting what's going on. So they're actually looking for yields. Now, this is what the commitment to trade report showing in the, in the futures market, that they're actually looking for yields to actually um, go down. Um, again, um, that's what they're saying. So uh, I'm looking at that. I don't see... Um, you know, now understand this. The commitment to trade report is a short-term report. It's showing what's going on with the trend. Um, and based on what we're seeing here, I would look for some confirmation. But look on what they're saying is they actually expect those those yields to actually go down, prices to go up. Pretty interesting. Um, I'm not sure how low they can take this, but that's what they're showing. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. So let me um, let me talk about a couple of things real quick. Um, last week, we, I had told you we were going through PRICEM, my PRICEM criteria. Again, PRICEM, product, reward to risk, um, capital, what the capital is being used for, scalable. The first M was market, and the last M we're doing today is management. So I, mean, I can sum this up real quick. One of the things that's really important on Wall Street is, and I've said this before, and it's a, it's a cliche, but it is, and that is that um, Wall Street bets on jockeys, not on horses, all right? Wall Street bets on the guys who are running the companies. We've seen it before. We've seen stocks take off and run just because of who the new managers came in. So with that said, when you start to look at companies that you really think could be the next, you know, what we call trendsetter, changing the course of business, changing the way things are done, you want to look at who's running the ship, who's running the company. I've seen a couple of companies, um, I'm not going to say which one, they had some technology that no one else in the world had. They were ahead of the curve. The guys who were the, were the scientists who came up with this technology decided they were going to run the company. And the company just never, ever, ever performed based upon what they had. It was an underperformer. The reason why I even bring it up is just because these people are great inventors, great creators, does not mean they know how to actually run a Fortune 500 company. You want to make sure that the person that's running this company knows what they're doing um, and can learn and grow and build a team around them. We, all, we always talk about Bill Gates. Bill Gates had a team around him, all right? So it wasn't just Bill Gates. It was other people around him that helped him build Microsoft. When you look at these companies that actually do the major moves, it's not an individual, it's a team. You want to look and see who's on that team, all right? That's the M in, the last M in Pricem. So that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to bring it up right now. All right, now, covered that. The other thing I want to do is, and I know, I, I know you're going to be surprised when I say this, but I had told you over the last couple of days, excuse me, a couple of weeks, I've been starting to track and look at the cryptos. And so, from my opinion, my opinion, what it's worth, the best way to trade the cryptos is through technical analysis, not through fundamental analysis. Um, the fundamentals are, are actually very unique on these cryptos, so it's hard to... It's hard, to, it's hard to trade a, a security, any type of asset, when it's basically the, the asset itself is based on supply and demand. Um, a, a example of that is we saw it with GameStop. There are no fundamentals in GameStop. It's basically all supply and demand. So I look, took the same approach with the crypto. So first one I'm going to do is Bitcoin. I'm just pulling up the chart real quick. I already looked at it, but I'm pulling it up. And... So here's the deal with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's in a trading range between 47,500, what's up, Tommy? And up the higher end of the range is up in the 60,000. So it's got a big range in between. What's really interesting, too, is that 
um, the volume has been really heavy here recently. Now, I'm going to say this uh, before I finish, say this again. I believe the cryptocurrencies as a group are in a bubble. All right, so I think they're in a bubble. I don't know, it's not a severe bubble, but they're moving towards a bubble. Uh, excuse me, they're in a bubble, and I think the bubble's just going to get bigger and worse. The reason why I think it's in a bubble, and guys, one of the ways you can actually figure out when an asset class is in a bubble is talk to people who don't normally invest in that asset class and find out what they're thinking about it, what, go, what they say. And when you hear people that normally don't trade cryptos or, or normally not traders or investors say, man, I'm buying cryptos, you can't, you can't lose on this. You know, you're always going to make money. And anytime it dips down, just buy the dips. You can't lose. It's so easy to make money. When you start hearing those kind of things from people that aren't respecting the risk in it, you start to know that you're in a bubble. Now, with that said, you can make a lot of money trading a bubble. Just don't be the last one in the bubble. So follow some certain rules. So one of the rules is don't buy in the dip. Wait for it to start to come back and show you it's coming back and then buy it. The reason being is because when this bubble does burst, it's going to start out as a dip. And then the problem is, is that you don't know if it's going to be a dip or the dam is actually broke. So stop trying to guess the lows. Stop trying to test where it is and don't buy the dips. Buy it on the way up. The second thing is, and this is the reason why I tell you to buy them at their all-time highs or buy them at the highs, is because if you're buying at the high, there's no question that you've reached a high. When you're trying to buy dips, the problem that you have is you're really trying to buy the low. You're trying to time where the low is. And you have no idea where the low is. The only time you know where the low is is after you've reached the low and it's turned and started to go back up. So don't buy the dips. So right now, um, Bitcoin is right in the middle of its trading range, right smack dab in the middle. Um, it could easily push towards that 60,000 number, easily could retrace back to that 47,500 number. So right now you're right in the middle. Whatever decision you decide to go is, if you decide to short it, just be ready to cover if it goes through 60,000. And if you decide to go long, if it breaks 47.50, and I can't see it breaking this, but if it breaks 47.50, you want to be out. But use your stop losses on that. All right, that's um, that's Bitcoin. The other one, I looked at all of them. So Ethereum. Ethereum, Ethereum, Ethereum. Another interesting one. Now, this chart's pretty interesting. It's in a long-term upward trend. Been really trading nicely. There's some, some port levels, but right now we're in a trading range between 2,200 and 2,600, give or take right around there. We broke through that and it's actually moved to a new high. So it's actually starting to form a whole new trading range. So where it's at right now, close to 2,733. You're looking at basically around 20, 25 and change is where your support level is. That's the old resistance level, but it's still in the upward trend. What's also interesting too is that um, the volume is somewhat picked up on these moves to the upside. So volume's actually starting to pick up. So again, on this one, it literally has looked like it just really broke out just, just uh, over the last two days. So that one is again, and the old high was 2,600 just above that. So you're not, you know, you're, you're still within that 10% range where it's not overextended yet. And I would not be surprised to see this thing tr run and trade sideways for a bit. All right, the other one I looked at was, um, I looked at a couple of those, but the other one that has been really popular is um, this Doji coin. And on this one, I looked at it and it's really interesting. Um, why that, oh, is that the right one? Hold on a second. I'm making sure I pulled up the one I wanted to talk about. There it is. All right, so, <laughs> Right now, Dogecoin has pulled back into a, a second trading range. There's two trading ranges in this. There's one between about uh, 32 cents, 33 cents to 45 cents. And then there's another trading range below that between looks like about 25 cents to 33 cents. So we've fallen back into that 25 to 33 cent range. Again, we're sitting there right in the middle. Um, it's kind of come down and tested. And by the way, these, that 25 cents is not hard. 23 cents, 24 cents, somewhere around there. But it's pulled back and it's tested that range and seems to bounce. Um, it's closed right now in the middle of that range at 30 cents. Um, and again, as you know, I think who was it? Um, one of them, Elon Musk or somebody was just literally 
again out there talking about uh, Dogecoin and, and buying it and so forth. So I, again, I would not, I would expect to see this thing have a push. That's why it has pushed today because they're out there talking about it. So again, technically in a trading range, technically you're looking for it. Hey Nicholas, what's going on? Looking for it to kind of push back up to that 330 range, 334 cents. Um, as long as they keep talking it up, you should get that. If it breaks the 25 cents, it's going to actually, which it did, but if it breaks the 25 cents, I would be surprised to see it stay down there just because you have so many people speaking about it. And again, today was up off a of heavy volume. I'm just checking the volume right now. Today was up off of what? The volume today was, volume today was uh, 58 million shares as compared to yesterday, which was 13 million shares. And the day before that, it was... Uh, 33 million shares. So you're seeing heavier volume over the last couple of days. It's still not above its 20-day moving average in terms of volume, but volume is there. All right, um, so that's Dogecoin. So quietly put, same thing. If you buy it now, it's in the trading range. Look for it to take out the 33 number. Um, and if it does, then it should actually push up to new highs or challenge going up to the 45 cents. And if it breaks the 25, 24 cents level, which it's done once and then bounced back. You can see it easily pull down to the 15, 16 cent range. All right, but again, you get enough publicity on this thing, enough people talking about that, you're probably gonna get some follow through. What's up, Dip Mayor Big Devon Day? All right, um, Doji Coin and the other one, um, who was the other one I just did? Oh, Ripple. One second, let me pull up. Ripple's the other one I did. Another interesting coin, um, Ripple's been a while, around for a while. It's not getting all the publicity that the other ones are. It's had some breakouts. And what's interesting is there's a trading range between the all high was $1.90, $1.95, all right? And it's pulled back to below, it's pulled back right now, it pulled back below support, supports around $1.40, and it came all the way back down again to a dollar, dollar, dollar two. And then it recently just started rallying and it rallied back and it's closing above the dollar 40. So it's trying to penetrate to get back to that old trading range. Um, volume has been relatively heavy, both to the upside and downside over the last month, two months. So out of those, um, again, it looks like it's trying to fight its way back. Based on what I'm seeing with these, with these Bitcoins, uh, these coins right now, these cryptocurrencies, I'd have to say that Ethereum is the one that, if I was buying anything right now, this is the one I'd buy. In fact, um, yeah, that's the one I'd buy. Um, I like it here. I'd put I'd put a stop loss probably just below this 20, around 25, 2,500, 2,600. But I'd put it you know, below 2,500, around 2,500. I'd put a stop loss there. Um, basically, which is a little over 200 points to the downside, which is basically a 10% move. You know, we're talking about a, a security that's trading at uh, 20, $2,700. So that's what I would do. Um, Christian, what's going on? How are you, buddy? All right. Um, all right. So let me see what else. I'm getting questions on a couple other stocks. So what's going on, guys, is I'm, I'm actually just, for those who just joined, I just gave my opinion on some of the cryptocurrencies. And I actually just basically said right now, the one that looks the best right now in terms of technical analysis is the Ethereum. It uh, broke out and it's at basically at all time highs, trading really well, broke through the old resistance and, you know, looks looks good. Volume's there. So that's the one I would actually buy right now. The other ones are in a narrow trading range. I would not, uh, I would wait for those to confirm themselves before I actually jumped in and brought um, yeah, Paul, I'm looking at cryptocurrencies. I talked about this in the call. I said, I'm trading them. I'm watching them. I'm going to start trading them. So I started out with technical analysis. I've been doing my research and studying on cryptos, understanding how they work, understanding the mining process, which ones are mine, which ones aren't mine. So I've been do doing my homework on this a little bit. Um, now I had a question on ADA. So hold on a second. Uh, what do I think about Cardona? All right. I have the chart up here right now. All right. Um, bear with me a second. Let me just go to a weekly. 
I have to keep an eye on this. So the first thing I'm saying is I'm starting to like it. I'll tell you why. All right, I'm looking at a weekly chart. Stock, uh, excuse me, um, Card Cardano. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Cardano, Cardano. Um, but anyway, so let me let me just go through this. I'm looking at it. It broke out from 19 cents traded, then went to 40 cents traded. So right now we're in a trading range. Put some color on this for me. This Cardano is in a trading range, roughly between a dollar and the old high. Well, I'm not gonna say the old high. It's got a couple of spikes in here, but it looks like it looks like it looks like you're in a trading range between. It looks like you're in a trading range between a dollar and a dollar thirty-one. It closed today at a dollar thirty-one, right here. So again, if it pushes through this dollar thirty-one tomorrow, I would expect it to challenge that dollar sixty. Um, technically, this thing looks really good. Technically, this thing looks like like it's done exactly what you want to see, and that is it's run a little bit, and it's backed and filled. And based upon this, let me move this up. That was a monthly chart, a weekly chart, excuse me. Yeah, so you're in the middle of a trading range. So the dollar thirty one was a near term trading range, but you can see based on the week uh, weekly. But you can see that the all high, which is at a dollar fifty, um, I would look based on what I'm seeing. I would expect it to challenge that dollar fifty. So if it cha challenges that dollar fifty and breaks through it, it's going to go to new highs and and and, and then some. Um, if it doesn't, if it fails, it'll pull back into that trading range between a dollar fifty. And a dollar, ten dollar, between a dollar ten and a dollar. So it's in a nice trading range. So I would look for it to break out. Any move, that's a good one. Whoever gave this to me, thank you. Any move through that dollar, dollar fifty one, dollar fifty two, with any type of volume on this is going to be a breakout. Now, for those who aren't into technical analysis, let me say this to you: the stock, the the currency, the crypto is in a trading range. This ADA, which is Cardona. It's in the trading range, and it's been in this trading range since February, right? Now, the longer a security stays in the trading range, it's like a rubber band being wound tighter and tighter, all right? So as long as it's in that trading range going sideways, it's like a rubber band being wound tighter and tighter, tighter and tighter. When it finally does break out on volume, it's going to break out hard and fast, either to the upside or to the downside. Now, based upon this chart and what I'm seeing technically, I'm going to I'm going to say I believe it's going to break to the upside. But again, the longer it goes sideways in that trading range and just turning, it's churning and churning. And to be technical, what you will, here's what's going on. When it reaches the upside of the trading range, the bears believe it's going to come down and there's more selling pressure and pushes it down to the bottom of the trading range. At the bottom of the trading range, the bulls are saying it's really cheap down here. We're going to buy it. And that's the battle that's going on. And as that battle goes and it churns and it churns and it churns, eventually it's going to break out. When it breaks out, it should break out to the upside. All right, so that's that. Um, Christian, you're correct. Corn is on a tear. Corn is on a tear. So it's funny, um, you got here late, a little late, Christian, but I talked about how when I give my commodities, I'm going to talk about commodities that give me a fundamental and a technical either buy or sell. Here's what's going on with corn. Corn is basically on fire. It's, just, it's, it's going parabolic. It's going straight up. Um, as corn increases in price, the commercials are getting net short, and they just keep getting net short, and they keep getting net short. So the challenge is, as you heard me talk about, the commercials are playing for the price to drop. The actual corn futures is drawing straight up. Eventually, they will come into what we call, um, um, they will come into alignment. The challenge is, we don't know when. So, on corn, which you always hear me say, technically it's a short. Fundamentally, excuse me. Fundamentally, it's a short. Technically, it's running. So I would either either go long and be and be careful with your stops, just knowing that at some point it will pull back. But right now, technically, it's, it's broken out. Um, I'm going to the chart right now. ZC. I'm looking at corn futures again. And I'm telling you, this thing is just going parabolic. Um, it broke out from six, some, from 
it broke out from $6 to $7.20. Now understand this, every penny move, for every penny move in corn, it translates to a $5,000, excuse me, $5.50 gain on your trade. Oh, I've got my tongue tied. Every penny move in corn is a $50 in your pocket. So I mean, just do the math. All right, so this is a, this has been a nice, nice move. It, it could be a short squeeze in here. I mean, this thing is going parabolic. So I haven't been looking at the I mean, the weather reports or anything like that, but it's going parabolic. It's going straight up. Um, based upon what I'm seeing here, one of two things is happening. Either the corn crop is really, the supply is not looking good at all, or this was basically a short squeeze. Um, and yes, they do have short squeezes in the commodity market. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm look, I'm, Christian, I'm looking at it. Christian, somebody that's close at all-time high, I'm looking at it. It just, it totally ran. The other thing I'm going to look at real quick is, is soybean. Give me a quick second. Yeah, soybean broke out and soybean ran too. So um, now soybean had a pullback over the last two days, but soybean broke out from 1440 to 1560. So they had another full dollar move. Same thing. Um, so the thing I'm going to say to you guys is this, based upon this kind of move we're seeing, it looks like it's probably more, it's more related to the currency. It's more related to our economy. Um, but again, weather's been kind of crazy. So I, I'm not sure if it's weather, but, uh, um, um, soybeans done, has, has had the same kind of breakout, not as much. Ooh. All right. Um, all right. Um, I covered, believe it or not, everything I have today. I don't have a lot. Um, let me repeat myself. These are just my thoughts, my opinions. Um, if you're going to make any buy or sell decisions, do it on your, you know, make sure you speak with your, your, your wealth advisor, your broker, whoever you're dealing with. Um, again, we're in earnings season, but these corporations' earnings, they're beating earnings. I mean, S&P either, I got to look, the S&P either closed at an all-time high or it's just off all-time high again. So, the overall broad market is running. The tech, the tech stocks are not running, but the overall broad market's running. The other thing which even um, Chairman Powell talked about today is that we're seeing we're seeing the housing stocks take off. Now, you guys have seen this, but a couple of reasons why. And I talked to you about this several weeks ago, several months ago, and I talked to you about the ability to actually look into the newspaper and read headlines and figure out how to make money off that. So a couple of things are happening. One, we're in a pandemic. The Fed took interest rates to the lowest level that they've been and mortgage rates to the lowest level they've been in, in basically in the last 30 years, 40 years. All right. We're seeing a lack of supply of housing. Because of the pandemic, a lot of individuals did not, did not want to put their house on the market for sale. Because of the pandemic, people that were thinking about selling the house decided to stay in the house, not try and move around during the pandemic. So the supply of houses available for sale have dropped. The home builders themselves have not been building homes. Now, so what that means is we're seeing a shortage of homes and we're also seeing the housing market take off because of the short, 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 shortness of, of, um, of homes. Now, um, I'm laughing as I say this. I want you to follow me through here. There's a short surplus, short supply of homes. So the home builders are, are, stock is up because we know that as soon as the home builders can build their homes, they will, they'll be able to turn around and flip them. All right. We know that real estate housing prices are basically at all time highs. And the reason why they're all time highs is because you have more buyers than homes available. So demand is greater than supply. Now, if the home builders need to increase their supply, let's let's follow this through. If the home builders need to be, build their supply. What are some of the things they're going to have to do to actually increase the supply in, you know, in terms of commodities? Well, two things. I just pulled up lumber, lumber futures. Lumber futures have been on a tear. I'm looking at the chart. I'm going to a monthly chart just so I can go back and see how far. And pretty much as I had thought, Lumber futures is at an all-time high. This is the highest they've been. Um, the highest they've been prior to this move right now was 603. 
Then we had a top at um, 1,000. And now we're at, four, we've been as high as 14.24. So lumber has broken out and run, but it makes sense that it would break out and run based upon the fact of we've got to build more homes. And so one of the key ingredients is lumber. Now, with that said, the next thing you should be saying to yourself is that's the key, if one of the key ingredients, the other key component material and, and building homes is, is copper. High grade copper. So I'm going to high grade copper. Bear with me a second. High grade copper. And look what just happened. High grade copper is broken out also to all time highs. All right, bear with me a second. I'm just I'm zooming this in. High grade copper is broken out to all time highs. Just that simple. We're at four 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 dollars and fifty cents. It was at four twenty five. Was the breakout? It's at four point five four fifty. All time highs. So, I keep saying this, and I'll say it again. No company or industry is in a bubble. There there are suppliers who supply that company that industry. And then that industry supplies somebody else. So we're seeing this. We're seeing a demand. We're seeing a demand for housing. All right. And supply is not there. So the only way that they're going to meet this demand, and again, how long will this demand last? Don't know, but the demand's there. The only way they can meet this demand is to what? They got to build more homes. S sell the ones that are in the market, increase the ones that are in the marketplace in terms of people selling. And by prices going up, that's going to attract more sellers. But the other thing, too, is in order to build more homes, guess what? you got to start going in and get inventory. You have to buy the supplies. You have to buy the raw materials. You have to buy the lumber. You have to buy the copper for piping. Those are two main components, two main materials. And you're seeing, a rea you're seeing the reaction here in the commodities market. Nothing's in a bubble by itself, guys. So I'm just, I'm just here to tell you now, um, as I look at this, I'm looking at the commitment of trade report for lumber. Bear with me a second. Commitment to trade report for lumber. Where's my lumber at? There it is. And what's interesting is, now this is interesting. The commercials themselves are, are, are well, let me, let me go to the detail report. Hold on a second. I'll tell you why I'm going to detail. Bear with me a second. So on the lumber side, the commercials are getting less and less short. What it means is the commercials are actually closing out their short position. Now they're still short from where they were, but over the last one, two, after the last three weeks, they've cut their, as a group, they've cut their net short position down by 25%. So you see, you're starting to see a trend change here. Let me look at copper, bear with me a second. Copper's probably doing the same thing. Copper, ah. Net short's about the same. It's actually, yeah, it's about the same. The net short, but the 52-week low is 80, 86,000 uh, short. Now it's short 55. So they actually have been increasing. But still, the net short. It's going to be an interesting call here in the lumber. It's going to be really interesting to watch this lumber and copper. All right, I'm looking. Any other questions? Fire away. Any other charts you want me to look at? I can look at those too. Um... But again, um, I, I just, I, you know, as I do these things with you guys, sometimes I get excited myself. I literally am writing down lumber and copper, high-grade copper. I'm probably going to move more towards the lumber. Um, those are the two I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, let's see what else. So I just got a question on CLF, CLF. Oof, excuse me. All right, let me go. As you guys know, and I'm going to talk about this as I do it. Um, first and foremost, anytime you guys are doing technical analysis. Uh, cool, I'll talk about the tax hikes. Um, anytime you start looking at technical analysis, um, one of the things I do is I leave, I always try and move to a a longer term chart, a monthly and a weekly. 
The reason why I do that is I want to see the volatility. I want to take out the volatility. I want to see kind of what's going on. You can see it better on a weekly basis. All right. So Cleveland Clifford, Cleveland Cliffs. All right. And you know I am. Cleveland Cliffs back in 2008 was as high as $120 a share. Then the old high was, and back in February 2011, the old high was $98 a share. And that's it. So the stock is basically now trading at $18 a share off of a high of 100 So it's basically done nothing but come straight down. So that's the first thing. Um, I'm switching it to a weekly, get a little idea. Yeah, I thought so. And now I'm switching to a daily. All right, so now let me... Um, I'm looking at daily chart. All right, good news or bad news? Well, here's the news. This stock is in a trading range between basically $14, $14.50, and a short-term resistance near term at, at 19, and some more resistance at 20. So it's basically in a trading range between $14 and $20. It's been in this range for the past since basically January. Um, the thing, I, again, this is me. Now, I don't know what kind of investor you are, long-term or short-term. And I'm looking, and I'm looking. And I'm looking. The reason why I'm looking is I'm trying to figure out once it goes through this $20 number where your next resistance is. And you got a ton of resistance between twenty and twenty-five dollars. Ton of resistance. Um, if you're a long-term holder, I don't see any reason. I'm, I'm laughing as I say this. I don't see any reason why I would stay with this thing long term. Um, there's probably some other good companies in, in the in the material industry in, the, in that in that sector that you could do a lot better with. If you already own it, I guess I would say weather out the storm, but it's going to be a rough ride. It's going to take a lot of work for this thing to actually get back up and even back up into the uh, $20 range as I look at it. Up, I mean, up into like the mid-20s and high-20s. It's going to take a lot of work. Yeah. Um, I don't know who their competitors are, but I would definitely look at their competitors. I would look at other areas. All right, now let me go back. I had a question by Nicholas. Can I talk about the potential tax hike on the stock market and cryptos? I don't know if the tax hike is going to really affect the stock market. The reason being is the tax hike is basically talking about is the ultra, ultra rich. Um, it's not going to affect us. So let me step, step back. We're basically talking about macroeconomics. All right, in macroeconomics, they have an effect on the market, on the, on the stock market, no question. Tight rate, interest, uh, excuse me, tax rate hikes, tax rate cuts, interest rates, um, those have a major impact on the market. The challenge that you have now is with this new tax hike they're talking about, it's not for the overall consumers. It's only for the ultra rich, the top 1%. I don't know if that's going to affect the stock market in that respect. The reason why tax hikes affect the stock market for us as a group is, when they raise taxes, it means that the average American, you and I, have less money. If we have less money because we're paying out in taxes, that's less money for us to spend as consumers, which means there's less money going into the economy, which means that the market's probably going to slow down and even go down. That's why, when, in, in general, when you see a tax rate increase, the market sells off. In this case, even with Biden talking about what he's doing, the market hasn't sold off because it's not going to affect the average consumer. Now, I'm not sure what the tax is going to be like on the cryptos. I'm not sure how they're going to handle that. Um, I'm not sure how the 1% is going to try and reposition their assets to try and avoid these taxes. I'm not sure. I don't know. But it's not going to affect overall all of us. And therefore, again, the market is affected by macroeconomics. But in this case, the tax hike is not going to, is not going to affect the majority of US, uh, U.S. citizens. It's only going to affect that 1%. So I don't think it's going to have an impact. Um, any book I can recommend to someone with very little knowledge? Um, that's a great question. I believe it's Justin, King Justin.
But the only challenge is I need to know, you need to give a little more information on what it is that you are looking for information on. You're talking about options, you're talking about stocks, you're just talking about understanding how the market works in general. So there's a number of books. And the other thing I'm going to say to you guys is, especially for you newer investors, um, you should become an avid reader. Read everything you can get your hands on. It, some of it you'll agree with, some of it you won't, some of it you'll understand, some of it you won't. Some of it's going to be basically garbage. All right, there's a lot of people out there putting out some bad recommendations or bad comments or bad things, but you have to, the, the, more, the better read you are, the easier it is going to be for you to actually navigate these waters and figure things out. So the thing I would say is books, 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 and there's a ton of them. So um, um, in fact, if you, um, Justin, if you remind me, I can actually um, send you a list of books. Now, with that said, again, I have and I am diligently working on classes. I'm telling you I'm working on it. Um, right now, I have presentations on the equity, equity markets, option, option market, um, shorts, shorts, margin, and um, who am I missing? I said options, equity. Oh, I'm working on bonds right now. So I'm putting these together. Again, it, it's time consuming because I want to make sure it's done right, but I am working on those. And as soon as they're available, as soon as I'm up and available, um, I will let you guys know all about them. And we're going to continue to keep adding more and more classes, courses on other topics as we move forward. Um, so right now, it's just, again, bear with me. I, I promise you, we, we are working on them. So you don't see them. You might not see me or hear me, but I am working on them and I will put them out there. And I think they're pretty powerful. And what we did was we started from the basics. Um, and some of you might be past the basics. We started from the basics, like what is a stock? What is a bond? And we're working our way towards that. And once you understand what a stock is, what a bond is, at that point, you'll be able to then move into talk, talking about different types of trading strategies and investment strategies. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up again too before I forget, and I talked about this last week, keep an eye on this stock, ASO. I don't own it yet. ASO is one. And the other one, believe it or not, was RXT. Rocket, uh, excuse me, that's Rackspace. The, um, here's what's interesting about both these stocks. They're both trading at their all-time highs. All right, They're both putting out good numbers, earnings estimates, and all that. They both have a huge short position. If I remember correctly, on ASL, they have about a 45, excuse me, a four and a half, five day float. In other words, if they was nothing but straight buying to cover the shorts, it would take them five days to cover the shorts. And the shorts increased over the last month. And what's interesting about this is the shorts increased their position last month and ASO beat the earnings and had a really good earnings call and also updated their, their prospects going forward. So they increased the forecast. Um, the other thing I did was I pulled up a chart on it. For those, again, who are in charts, there is a nice pennant forming. And again, when these things form, it's forming, a nice pennant flag's forming, off, and volume's decreasing. So a pennant flag is the, the lows are get the highs are getting lower. At the same time, let's see if I can get this, the lows are getting higher. It's coming to a point. And typically when that happens, when it does break out, it's going to break out and run, and it should challenge that old high. Now the chat, but again, if it breaks out and starts to run, then those and those shorts start to cover, you could see a short squeeze. So that's what's really interesting about this. Business seems to be doing well. Rack space is the same story. RXT. Pull up the chart on that one. The chart's not nearly as nice as ASO, but it's in the trading range between 24, 24 and change. And 26 and change, it's in that trading range. And 26 and change is an all-time high. Now, earnings are due out on this one on May 10th. So I would keep an eye on those. Again, you could end up seeing a short squeeze here. It's really interesting. I'm not sure. Again, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think what's happening here is you have a lot of institutions of people that like to short stocks that are basically trading at their all-time high. But again, this when you see this type of short position that they have, you know, it's about eight million shares if I remember correctly. That's not mom and pop. That's institutional investors. 
It's a pretty interesting story here. So I'm not sure what's going on with this. It, and by, by the way, it's Academy Sports ASO. So take a look. Um, all right, let's see. All right, that was about my master class. And if, if I don't have anything else, if you guys have another stock you want me to look at, I'll pull it up and take a look. If not, I'm going to say to you adieu. Um, Christian, I'm not sure if Christian's still on the call. Christian Pedroza. Christian, if you are, Christian sent me some really, really interesting information. Um, I'm looking through it. Um, eventually, I'll talk to Christian about sharing it with you guys and sharing it with you guys. But really interesting information that Christian sent to me. All right, guys, I'm about to sign out. Um, no more questions. I'm signing out. Have a great, great trading week. Um, I'm going to go check and see what Apple and, and um, Facebook did for earnings. Have a great week. And I will see you next uh, next Wednesday. And once again, you can follow me. I'm going to post this on Instagram. You can also follow me on YouTube under the same channel. And again, if you decide to do anything here or anything's piqued your interest, make sure you speak to your wealth advisor before doing any trades. Um, and if you need help finding a wealth advisor, there's a bunch of guys on this call that I've trained and worked with that really could just can do an excellent job with you. All right. And again, I am working on the master classes. I promise you, I am working on them. All right, have a great week, and I will talk to you later. Milligan signing out.